fun stuff. Hi, I'm Mark Horowitz. The hobby of small-scale live steam locomotives is rapidly growing today. And during this program, we'll look at many of the different aspects of this fascinating endeavor. Now, by small scale, I mean locomotives that run on gauge O or gauge 1 track, not the monster ride trains that we see in the park. Small scale live steamers are designed not for passenger hauling, but for scenic running only. Now, why do you suppose people are attracted to steam locomotives? I'm sure everyone has their own reasons. For me, I enjoy them aesthetically, mechanically, and philosophically. Aesthetically, there's something very pleasing about the proportions of a well-designed steam locomotive. I enjoy seeing the wheels go around and the rods moving, and to me, the natural landscape looks unnatural unless there's a steam train traveling across it. I've always admired simple and elegant mechanisms, and the steam locomotive, even in its most complex form, is basically a simple mechanism. Now, when I was a very young child, one of my abiding fears was that the government or some unknown authority would arbitrarily change our electrical wall outlets, thus depriving me of the pleasure of playing with my electric trains. Even in those very early years, I understood that electricity was the soul of our existence in this society and that without it, we'd be lost. So in that light, there has always been something magical to me about a machine that would perform what it was supposed to do perfectly in the way that it was designed without the movement of a single electron. I have the same feeling about sewing machines. Now you'll have to work out your own aesthetics and philosophies, but I can tell you something about the mechanics of small-scale live steamers. So let's go inside and begin. <laughs> I think it's always nice to know a little bit of history about the things that we're studying, to know where we come from, to know a little bit about our roots, and to understand a little bit about why things are the way they are today. The history of live steam locomotives in the model form paralleled very closely the development of full-sized steam locomotives. There were many toy makers who were making uh, steam engines in toy form back in Germany primarily and also in Britain in the 1800s and things were pretty well scattered until in the late 1800s the Martland Company, which is still alive and very well today, decided to standardize the gauges. Martland's gauges were named gauge 1, 2, and 3, with gauge 1 being the smallest. And later when a new gauge came in, there were not any numbers left, so it was assigned the letter 0. So what we know today as O gauge is actually 0 gauge. The popularity of the hobby rose at a steady rate throughout the 20s and 30s and the little steam engines evolved into two primary classes, toy engines and model engines. This is an example of an early toy engine. It's made entirely of brass, construction is very crude, it was designed not to pull any train at all, and was actually designed to run on the floor even though the wheels do have flanges. The front axle is steerable manually so that you can preset it, put it on the floor, and it will run around in a circle and come back to you. The burner, which was probably somewhat of a danger, is uh, nothing more than cotton wadding, which was to be soaked in alcohol, stuck back under the boiler, and ignited. If there was the slightest breeze, I'm quite sure the engine wouldn't run at all. It has such amenities as a whistle, a throttle, and of course a safety valve, which every engine should have. The latter category, which were the model engines, were very efficient, but very expensive, because they were primarily handmade models built by private individuals for sale or uh, sometimes by the larger companies. So the live steam hobby in the early part of the century was largely the domain of the wealthier upper classes and those uh, who had the mechanical wherewithal to make their own engines in their own home shops. Two people who did a lot to bring small-scale steam within the reach of everyone were Henry Greenlee, who designed a lot of little and big engines for the Bassett Lowe Company, and an eccentric engine designer who went under the pen name of LBSC, LBSC being the initials of the London, Brighton, and South Coast Railway in England for which this fellow worked when he was younger. And he published many, many designs in the Model Engineer magazine, and his words and music, as he called them, enabled even the, the rankest of beginners to build a live steam locomotive in his home workshop. And this really brought the live steam hobby into the home, it brought it to the masses, and it enabled everyone who wanted to, to have his own live steam engine. And then the commercial makers were keeping pace as well. Probably the best known of these was Bassett Loke, who existed from before the turn of the century until up into the 1960s. This is one of uh, Bassett Loke's typical O-gauge engines, it's one of their moguls, which uh, they made by the absolute thousands. 
for about 20 years, and just about every British boy who wanted a steam locomotive aspired to this one. It's simply constructed, simply designed, and under the right conditions would pull a, a reasonable train for a reasonable distance. However, outdoors, if there was any wind or if the weather was cold or anything, it just wouldn't really perform up to snuff. After World War II, small-scale steam engines suffered a decline in popularity, as did all of the larger gauges. With the interest in miniaturization, uh, the trains were moving indoors, and by the late 50s, the popularity of small-scale live steam engines had almost died out entirely. In the late 1960s, Stuart Brown of England started his company, Archangel Models. It was his desire to produce reasonably priced, reliable engines that anyone could have. He wanted to put the small-scale steam locomotive into the hands of everyone. So he designed to the scale of 16 millimeters to the foot running on gauge O track. This may sound strange, but really it's not. He designed narrow gauge engines, and in Britain, most of the narrow gauge engines are two foot gauge. That is, uh, the rails are two feet apart. So he took this two foot gauge, he wanted to use the existing model gauge of O gauge, so he divided that in half to get two. O gauge is 32 millimeters, divided in half, 16 millimeters. He didn't actually invent this scale, but not too many people really were using it before he commercialized it. Dave Rollins and Jack Weldon each bought one of Stewart's engines and started writing about it in the British press. And their enthusiastic reports on the performance of these engines really started things going in Britain in the late 60s and early 70s. Also, mention must be made of the Gage One Model Railway Association of Great Britain. They have been formed now for over 25 years, and they kept interest in both gauge one and small scale steam alive during the long dry spell. Their interest primarily is in one to 32 scale standard gauge trains running on gauge one track, whereas Stuart Brown's interest was in narrow gauge trains running on gauge O track. Now you all know the difference between scale and gauge. Scale is nothing more than the proportion of the model to the full-sized article. Gauge is nothing more than the distance between the rails. These two things are often confused, and they really shouldn't be, because they're both quite simple. If you say O scale, all you're referring to is the proportion of this O scale model to a full-size model. If you're saying O gauge, what you are referring to is the track gauge of 32 millimeters. Now you may be wondering, why small-scale steam never really caught on in the United States the way it did in England. I don't know, but I have an idea. Back around the 1880s, when live steam was just catching on in Europe, what were we doing over here? We were trying to settle the West, we were trying to expand the country, we were trying to get settled as a nation. We didn't have a whole lot of time for toy trains and model trains and such like that. Then along about 1900, a young fellow in New York named Joshua Cowan developed an electric train. Now, electric trains were nothing new. There were companies uh, like Carlisle and Finch who had developed them before. But uh, Cohen was a marketing genius as well as a mechanical genius, and he really put electric trains on the map. And he decided to name his trains after himself, and neither Joshua nor Cohen fit very well, so he decided to name them after his middle name, which was Lionel. And he really started the snowball rolling. Other manufacturers like American Flyer and Ives and Dorfan and some of the others jumped on board his wagon, producing electric trains to the same gauges and scales that he was doing. And electric trains were really off and running. And by the 1930s, when small-scale live steam was very, very popular in Britain and in some of the other European countries, electric trains in this country were just going gangbusters, and small-scale live steam just never really had a chance. So until the larger-scale trains started coming back, really in the 70s, there was no live steam in this country to speak of. In the late 70s, the Astra Company started producing their line of gauge one locomotives, and then um, Stuart Brown and some of the British makers started producing them. A line of German engines came in in the late 70s from Beck, who made the Anna, which we'll see later on. So finally, the live steam hobby in this country started to catch on, and it is where, where we see it today. <laughs> The 
Before we get into the nitty-gritty of the internal workings of a steam engine and all the variations thereof, I want to give you a general sense of a steam engine and what makes it go. I have this chart here, which is how a steam engine works mostly. First you have a boiler filled with water and uh, with a fire adjacent to it. The fire boils the water, creating steam in the top part of the boiler, which comes out of the boiler in a steam line. It goes through some sort of restricting device or valve, which we call a throttle or regulator. From the throttle, the steam line goes down into the steam chest, which contains a valve. This valve moves back and forth, alternately admitting and exhausting the steam from the cylinder. The valve travel is controlled by this valve rod, which is attached quite often times to an eccentric or some eccentric device. You'll see that the axle does not pass directly through the center of this circle, but off to one side, and when the axle rotates, this rotates with it, creating a reciprocal motion, which drives this valve. Now the steam goes from the steam chest through the valve into the cylinder, pushing the cylinder, or pushing the piston rather, to the end of the cylinder. When the steam is done pushing the piston, it goes back out through the port in which it came in and it is exhausted. And the valve moves to the other side, admitting steam to push the piston back to the other end of the cylinder. Thus, the cylinder goes back and forth. This, this reciprocating motion is translated through these rods to the wheel where it becomes rotary motion and the engine thus moves forward. <laughs> The heart of any steam locomotive is its boiler. If you have an engine with a bad boiler, you've got a bad engine, no matter how good the rest of it is, because there's nothing you can really do. Boilers, in general, fall into two main categories, externally fired and internally fired. Externally fired means that the fire is entirely outside of the boiler assembly. Internally fired means the fire goes up inside or through the boiler, and I'll show you examples of both. The very simplest boiler is the externally fired boiler, so we'll start with that. In its most simple incarnation, we have the pot boiler. Externally fired boilers are also called pot boilers. This is nothing more than a tin can soldered together with water inside and a fire underneath. Most of the early engines were pot boilers in the toy category, and some of the uh, best engines today also are pot boilers. Archangel engines, uh, many of the early ones are pot boilers, and they're quite efficient and quite strong. Now, there are several variations to the pot boiler, one of which is the pot boiler with water tubes. These tubes extend down beneath the boiler and go into the fire. And what this does is it increases both the, the surface area of the fire, that is the heating area, the area that the fire touches, and also the water capacity of the boiler. When we talk about boilers, what we're concerned with is the ratio of heating area or surface area to volume of water within the boiler. There is no, no scientific research been done, so nobody really knows what the ratios are, but I think if you went through and measured each boiler, figured out the surface area, and figured out the volume of water contained in each one, you would come up with some distinct patterns that indicated efficiency or non-efficiency of a boiler. One of the most popular boilers in use today is the porcupine boiler, and this was uh, developed in large part by Jack Weldon of Great Britain. It's basically a pot boiler with these quills soldered into it, hence the name porcupine. And these extend down into the fire. They don't increase the volume of the water, but they do increase the effective surface area. These quills heat up much hotter than the surface of the boiler, and they take the heat inside to the water. Now, a pot boiler is going to function best if it's enclosed in a firebox. And this is the end of a firebox developed by Jack Weldon for his porcupine boilers. What we have here at the bottom is the burner, and there's a plate across the bottom which will restrict the air coming into the firebox. If we get too much air, um, it tends to take too much of the heat away. Cold air will cool off. If we have too little air, we'll have improper combustion, uh, the fire may go out, uh, the boiler just won't function properly. So through trial and error, Jack developed 
this firebox that restricts the air but does not cut it off entirely, allowing for good combustion. There's a significant space between the top of the burner and the boiler, allowing for combustion. The hot gases come up around the sides of the boiler and out through this space at the top. So what you have here is an effective heating surface from this point all the way around to this point. You get maximum combustion out of the fire, which means the fuel is used to its, its best efficiency. And what you end up with is a very efficient boiler that can run anywhere from 30 to 45 minutes. I've heard reports of them running for as long as an hour and 15 minutes without uh, refilling the boiler, which is quite good. So that's basically pot boilers. Now, an internally fired boiler has the fire inside the boiler, and probably the simplest one is the Smithy's boiler. What a Smithy's boiler is essentially is a pot boiler inside an external shell. I have an actual Smithy's boiler here to show you so you can understand better how the thing goes together and how it works. This is from an Aster kit, the, uh, their Mogul, one of their earlier engines. This is the boiler shell, and this is the external shell. The boiler is made of copper, which is an absolutely wonderful material, and most small-scale steam locomotive boilers are made of copper tubing, silver soldered together. This makes a very, very strong structure uh, as a pressure vessel. This boiler barrel fits inside this external shell. I'm putting it together upside down so you can see how it'll actually work. This is the firebox here. This is a, an alcohol fire boiler. The wicks go in here and in here. And keeping in mind that this is upside down, you can see there's space all around the boiler and that these water tubes extend down into the fire. You can see at the front end that the boiler shell does not extend all the way to the front of the um, outer casing. This front part is called the, the smoke box. This is uh, where the hot gases collect before they go out the smokestack, which actually comes out of this hole here. Pretend my finger is the smokestack. All externally fired boilers require a blower to get them going and to keep them going. To get an internally fired engine going, you take a fan that looks like this, it's battery powered, and you stick it in the top of the stack. What the fan does is it creates a suction. It creates a, a partial vacuum inside the boiler shell. And since the fire is way back here under the back end of the boiler, it has to get all the way through this barrel out the top. And that partial vacuum pulls the hot gases up around the boiler. The advantage of this is you have a very large surface area to heat, so you, you get much more efficiency out of your boiler. So once the, the fan has done its work, and your boiler pressure is up, the fan can be removed entirely and the engine's own blower turned on. And what that is, is nothing more than a jet of steam that comes out the bottom of the smoke box and squirts out the top of the stack. That maintains the partial vacuum through a venturi effect and the um, fire will stay lit. There are many variations to internally fired boilers in small scale locomotives that you don't have in the larger scales. One of these is the Wrighton boiler. Again, the fire is back in a firebox. Uh, this case, a dry firebox, which means that there is no water surrounding the fire, just above it. Then there's a large internal flue which connects the firebox to the smoke box. And inside this flue are cross tubes, which um, increase both the volume of water contained which uh, increases the duration and the surface area, the heating area, which increases efficiency. So this dark area here, which uh, probably reads as black to you, is actually the water. Above it is the steam. This red is the fire, of course. And that spot there is what happens when you put your finger on the picture before the paint's dry. This is another internally fired boiler. This one is used by the Aster company on their 042 Baldwin engine. You have four burners themselves encased in a firebox actually beneath the boiler. Above each burner is a very short vertical tube communicating to a larger horizontal flue that goes up to the smoke box. 
Keep in mind that all of these internally fired boilers require a blower, a fan to get them going, and a steam blower to maintain the steam once they are cooking. This is the single flue gas boiler. And what this does is um, it has a large open flue uh, that goes all the way through the boiler. At the back end is the burner, and the actual burner sits inside this flue. There's the, the gas line from uh, your gas supply. We'll talk about fuels in a little bit. And the gas goes through a jet, which fires into this burner, collecting air as it goes, and uh, these are generally set at the factory so you get proper air mixture, although some of them you can't adjust yourself. The gas burns very hot right here, and the, the force of the gas propels the hot gases through the flue into the smoke box and out the stack. Again, here's your water level, here's your steam level. You never want to fill a boiler up entirely because if you do, all you'll get when you turn it on is hot water into the cylinders and out the stack and into your face if you're looking down on it. Now these gas-fired boilers generally do not require blowers to keep them going. The force of the gas through the whole system is enough to keep the hot gases moving through the boiler and out the top of the engine. The most sophisticated boiler for small-scale steam engines is what is called the locomotive type boiler. Now this is the same type of boiler that is used in full-size locomotives. And basically the way it works is like this. There's a firebox which is entirely surrounded by water on all sides except the bottom. There are many, many tubes which run between the firebox and the smoke box. And these can vary in number anywhere from from three to uh, many dozens in the larger engines. What you have here is a very, very large heating surface area and a very, very small water capacity. So to keep the engine going for any length of time, water must be pumped into the boiler while the engine is in motion or at least while the fire is going. This can be done with a pump on the axle or with a hand pump. So when you see the water is getting low, you stop the engine pump a little water into it and let it go again, or you adjust the pump on the axle to keep the boiler level uh, maintained throughout the run. These um, internally fired boilers, in general, can be kept in steam indefinitely as long as water can be pumped into them while they are under pressure. This uh, shows the blower, the position of the blower at the bottom of the smoke box, blowing a jet of steam through the, the smokestack to draw the fire out through the smoke box. But many of these boilers have what they call a superheater. And what that is, is the steam line, after it comes out of the boiler, before it goes to the cylinders, will go back through the fire to get one more thermal boost before hitting the cylinders. In a locomotive boiler, it'll come out the top and it'll go back through one of these large superheater flues in, in kind of a U-shape. It'll go back and then out again and then down to the cylinders. One of the variations of the locomotive type boiler is a boiler designed by John Van Riemsdyk, who is another British designer working in Gage 1. And I have an example of his boiler with me today. This is a boiler, his Type C boiler, which he designed for the Astor Company. And as you can see, it's, it's very simple to construct, which makes it uh, less expensive from a commercial point of view. You have a simple boiler barrel with three tubes that extend all the way through it. Not like the um, locomotive boiler where you have some very complex internal shapes that have to be manufactured. The beauty of this boiler is that it has a firebox, in this case made out of stainless steel, which fits on just like this. Now the, again, this is a dry firebox. The fire is here, it's an alcohol fire, so the wicks go here and here and the gases are pulled with the blower through the firebox back around and into these tubes and through the tubes into the smoke box. It's a very efficient boiler. It's simple. These hoods, which are actually extensions of the boiler tubes, help direct the, the, the flames through the boiler. And it's, it's quite a nice boiler. It was used on Astor's model of the um, British locomotive, the Mallard. 
Some engines, not too many, but a few, have vertical boilers. Um, the vertical boiler was uh, pretty much standard for all the old stationary engines, and they were adapted for locomotive use too, including use in small-scale steam locomotives. And again, there are many variations on the vertical boilers. I have just two here. This one is shows a single vertical flue. Uh, the vertical flue obviously gives you surface area. The fire's in the bottom. These are considered internally fired boilers, but they do not need a blower because the draft created by the hot gases going up are enough to, to keep the boiler going. This is the same boiler with the addition of cross tubes through these, this, uh, this central flue here, which increases both your heating surface area and the water capacity. Obviously, the more water you have, the longer you'll be able to run. The more heating area you have, the harder you'll be able to make your water faster, uh, the more efficient you'll be. The efficiency in small-scale steam locomotives varies widely. You have engines that are more efficient and that are less efficient, and it's uh, basically a matter of taste as to what kind of engine you like. The engines with the higher efficient boilers are more maintenance intensive. You, ha you have to keep with them while they're running more. You have to make sure the water level doesn't get too low because you can damage the boiler. Um, the less e efficient engines, uh, the pot boilers, are, you can generally set them and let them go. Even if they uh, burn down to a nub, you're still going to be safe. So I think that pretty well covers the boilers. Our next section will be boiler fittings. <laughs> Every boiler has a greater or lesser number of boiler fittings. Fittings are devices that are attached to the boiler to perform different functions. And I have the Astra Climax locomotive here, which I'll use to illustrate some of the different fittings and their functions. The first one, and the very most important, is the safety valve. As you can see, this engine has two safety valves. Every boiler has at least one. The safety valve is designed to release excess pressure inside the boiler into the atmosphere, and under no circumstances should that be fooled with. Don't tighten it down, don't modify it, don't adjust it, don't do anything to change its design performance. If you do that, you can put yourself in great peril, which is generally not a good thing to do. Then we have the throttle. On the Climax locomotive, it's inside the cab on the back head of the boiler. The back head is the back plate of the boiler to which most of the fittings are usually attached. The throttle in this case is a needle valve uh, on which is a wheel. You turn the wheel counterclockwise to open it, you turn it clockwise to close it. This allows a greater or lesser amount of steam into the cylinders and that controls the engine speed. The water glass, which most internally fired boilers have, is located on this engine uh, next to the fireman's window over here. The internally fired boilers need a water glass more than a pot boiler would because it generally contains less water. It has a greater heating area and a smaller water space. So you need to keep an eye on the amount of water in the boiler closer than on a pot boiler. The water glass is actually a glass tube through which you can see the actual level of the water in the boiler. Many of the engines have pressure gauges. The pressure gauge is a handy thing to have. Again, it's not essential, but it's, it's a nice amenity. The pressure gauge tells you how much steam pressure you have. It gives you an idea of when it's all right to start up, when you've achieved working pressure, and when you get to know the engine a little better, you can actually use the pressure gauge to gauge the amount of water that's left into the boiler. You'll be able to determine it by the um, behavior of the gauge and the behavior of the engine. As was discussed earlier, most internally fired boilers have a blower. This particular engine does not have a blower. It's a gas-fired engine, so it doesn't need one. But the blower valve is generally just a needle valve on the back of the boiler, which opens the steam into the blower pipe so you can get the jet of steam up the smokestack to draw the fire through the boiler. A check valve is a handy thing to have on a boiler for fi filling it if you don't have um, other filling devices. What that is is a ball valve it's a one-way pressure valve, and the pressure of the boiler keeps the ball seated and keeps the valve closed until you're ready to fill it with a hand pump, which is generally an external thing, a trackside pump, that sort of thing. You attach the pump to the check valve and start pumping. 
the pressure from the pump will be greater than the boiler pressure. It'll force the valve, or the ball rather, off its seat and allow the water to come into the, to the boiler. So you can fill the boiler that way through the check valve. The whistle valve is also a boiler fitting. Uh, this engine doesn't have a whistle. Uh, it seems like most of the engines do not. It, for some reason, only the cheapest and very most expensive engines have whistles. Why that is, is beyond me. More sophisticated engines, like this one, will have an axle pump. The axle on the climax is right here, and the pump is attached to the axle. There's an eccentric on the axle that drives the pump. It's concealed on this engine, and you really can't see it. That pump is connected to the water supply, which is in the second tender on this particular engine, through a series of hoses, and there's also a bypass valve, which is another boiler fitting. The axle pump pumps all the time that the engine is in motion. The bypass valve controls the amount of water that actually enters the boiler. The remaining water will be circulated back into the tender body. By properly adjusting the bypass valve, you can set the bypass system to maintain a constant level of water in the boiler so that the boiler can be virtually unattended. In addition to the axle pump, many engines have a hand pump that's built into the engine. In the climax, it's back inside this hatch. You can look down there and you can see it. There's a handle that slips down there to operate the pump, and when you're just starting the engine out, you can put the handle in and pump up the water level, which you see in the glass, to the desired point, and then you're ready to fire the engine up. While the engine's going, you can use the axle pump. If the engine is standing while the fire is on for any long period of time, then you can use the hand pump to bring up the level of the water if need be. Now some of the less efficient boilers, the pot boilers, use uh, a device called the vacuum tap or the blowdown valve. It's the same thing and it provides two different functions. It's essentially just a needle valve attached to the boiler. The way it works is when you're done running, that is when the boiler water level gets too low, you stop it and you open the valve after having extinguished the fire and you release all the excess steam inside the boiler. When boiler pressure drops to zero, there will still be a little bit of steam left in the boiler, which has to condense back into water. As that happens, a vacuum will be created inside the boiler, and you can use that vacuum to pull water through the vacuum tap back into the boiler, thus refilling it. And that pretty much covers most of the basic fittings that you'll find on small-scale live steam locomotive boilers. <laughs> The next item on the agenda to be discussed is fuels, and the first fuel I'll talk about is alcohol. The alcohol of choice is methyl alcohol, methanol, or methylated spirits, uh, depending on who you're talking to. You can buy this at a drugstore in pint bottles, or you can buy it from a scientific supply house um, in gallon containers, or you can buy it from speed shops, which are automobile racing supply houses also in gallon containers, which is probably the most economical place to buy it. Now, alcohol has both advantages and disadvantages. One of the advantages is that it is it's relatively cheap when compared with butane gas, which is the other popular fuel. Another advantage is that alcohol cannot burn hot enough to melt the seams in a silver solder boiler if you should be uh, so unlucky as to let your boiler run dry. Alcohol can be used at any temperature, including weather below freezing. And finally, alcohol is the traditional fuel for model steam locomotive firing, which makes it uh, appealing to me. I like that. As far as the disadvantages go, alcohol can be very messy if you're not careful. Uh, you can spill it, um, which could create a, a possible danger. If your burner boiler arrangement is inefficient, it can create some pretty strong smells and it'll burn your eyes, which makes alcohol a poor candidate for use indoors. And finally, an alcohol fire is just about invisible in the bright sunlight, which is a fact I'd like to demonstrate to you right now. You may notice that I have four alcohol burners sitting next to me, one of which has been lit the entire time I've been speaking. And even in these bright lights, which is not even uh, as bright as sunlight gets, I don't know if you can see the fire or not, but just to uh, prove to you that it actually is lit. Now I'll tell you a little story about this that happened to me one time with my good friend Larry Lindsay. We were out playing in the bright sunlight with our locomotives and he was lighting up the engine. We had a gallon can of alcohol 
and he was filling the locomotive with a syringe. He was making the mistake of trying to fill a locomotive that was already lit with a syringe, and as he drew the syringe away from the engine, the alcohol that was left on the tip of it ignited. Well, we didn't see it. I couldn't see it. It was bright sunlight. I was standing over the gallon can of alcohol, and he put the syringe back in the can to take some more alcohol into the syringe. The thing didn't actually explode, but it went poof, and the fire kind of jumped out the top, and it kind of singed a few of my little beard hairs here. And um, I wasn't too pleased about it, but of course it wasn't Larry's fault, and it wasn't my fault. It's just one of those things that you have to be very careful about. There are many kinds of alcohol burners, but there are two basic categories. There are wick burners and there are vaporizing burners. And I have a couple examples of each of those here. This is a vaporizing burner from an old Bassett Loke engine. This is an ore gauge engine. And basically it works like this. There's a large storage tank here that, uh, into which the alcohol goes. This is a vent pipe. The alcohol goes into this filler cap. The alcohol goes into this uh, long reservoir underneath here. And what this uh, little tube is right here is a pilot wick. Now the way this works is you light this pilot wick and let it heat up for a minute. Inside this larger tube is another wick which draws the alcohol up into this flattened out tube on the top. Now there are holes in here that you can see. Now after the pilot wick is lit, this tube heats up and the alcohol which is in here begins to vaporize and turn into actually alcohol vapor. When it's warm enough, you, you can light the top of this, and what you get are a series of very, very tiny, very, very hot blue flames. And this is a good burner for very, very calm situations, but it's very, very easy to blow out. Now this is another vaporizing burner, which is nothing more than a tank filled with some absorbent material, I believe this has probably got fiberglass in it, and a piece of stainless steel mesh across the top. You fill this up with alcohol, and you light it at the top and you're in business. This particular one fits inside a firebox, so it's fully enclosed, and because of that, it will run in just about any kind of weather. Now, here is one of the, uh, the wick burners that I was talking about. This is uh, a pretty basic unit here. There's a tank here, there's a filler tube here, and there's an overflow tube right back here. What you do is you fill it up until you see the alcohol coming out the overflow. That means you've got a full tank, of gas. Now this particular burner has had its volume extended by actually making the tank come all the way out here, which is an advantage in one sense and a disadvantage in another sense. You have more alcohol, which will, will give you a longer running time, but what happens is the heat from the flame is uh, con conducted down through the metal, through this tank, and back into this tank, which causes the alcohol in the storage tank to vaporize and the vapor comes out here. And this can ignite, if you're not careful, and burn up your paint or your whole engine. I've had to uh, dump water on engines sometimes because the alcohol has ignited at the vent hole. You can also put an extension on this vent hole to get the vapors away from the fire and exhaust it at a safe distance away. Now, the top level of the alcohol inside here has to be below the level of the wick tube, the top of the wick tube. If it's not, if you fill this tank up higher than the wick tube, all the alcohol will come out the wicks and pool over everything, and you're on fire once again. Now this is another alcohol burner, very similar to this one, except that all of the alcohol is contained in the tank here. This is the filler tube. The overflow tube is on this side. Now the advantage here is that you have very little metal to conduct the heat back to this tank so that the um, alcohol inside the storage tank really doesn't vaporize as much as it does in the other burner. What you sacrifice, of course, is running time. Now there are other ways that you can keep the heat from going back into the storage tank. One way is to cut the burner here and connect the two pieces with a piece of silicon tubing or something else that doesn't really conduct the heat. Another way is to put radiating fins, like the same kind of fins that are like cooling fins on a motorcycle engine. And those will keep the heat this way and keep the cool this way. And that works quite well. There's another kind of wick burner called a chicken feed burner, and it looks like this. 
it works in the same way that the chicken feeders down on the farm work. The advantage to this system is that the alcohol level can be much higher than the wick tube level. What you have here is a storage tank of any capacity at any height, and underneath that you have a sump. Now the level in the sump must be maintained below the top of the wick tubes, and the way that works is through a series of tubes inside the tank. There's a control valve, which you see here. When opened, the alcohol flows from the storage tank down into the sump until the level reaches a vent tube, which is here. When that occurs, a vapor lock happens, which prevents more alcohol from flowing down into the sump until the level in the sump goes down below that vent tube. Here you can see that this burner is connected with this tank by a length of non-conductive material. Aside from this um, tank and sump arrangement, the burner is pretty much the same as any other normal alcohol burner. The advantage is A, that you can have the alcohol at any level, and B, that you can have as much alcohol in there as you can possibly store. Now when you buy the alcohol at the drugstore, it comes in a bottle like this. The first thing you should do is take the top off, get out your little bottle of red food coloring, and color it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight drops. All right. As good as the count on Sesame Street. Put the top on, give it a little shake. Now you have red meths. Why do you want to do this? Well, the biggest reason you want to do this is so you don't confuse the alcohol with the water. This may sound really stupid, but I'll tell you a story. I didn't actually witness this. A friend of mine told me this. A fellow got out his steam engine one day, filled it up, lit the fire, and waited for pressure to come up, which it did with abnormal rapidity. The needle just, he was watching it swing over on the pressure gauge. The next thing he knew, the safety valve had lifted, and he was standing there next to his engine with a six-foot plume of flame coming out the top. What had happened was he had confused his alcohol with the water, stuck it in the boiler, and lit it. The alcohol vaporized almost instantly, and the vaporized alcohol coming out the safety valve ignited. He had no choice but to douse the engine in water to put the fire out, and I think he learned a lesson. The second thing I want to talk about just now, set these over here, is wicks, wick packing and wick height. The wicks that you see in this burner are packed properly and they're trimmed to just about the right height. Now the idea in wick packing is to pack them so that you achieve a nice blue cone of flame. If you pack them too loosely, you'll get a raging fire. If you pack them too tightly, you'll starve the fire and just get a puny little flame that really won't do the job for you. Wick packing is very much a trial and error thing. Now the wicks in this burner are made out of a fiberglass material that's sold as fireplace caulking. It comes in a braided rope and you can buy this from your fireplace supply store. You unbraid the rope and use the strands as wicks. The traditional wick material is asbestos, and some of the engines that you still get from England or Japan may be packed with this asbestos wick material. It's fine. You can use it. Just be careful with it. Before you use it, wet the stuff down with alcohol or with water so the particles don't fly around in the air, and then you can go ahead and, and pack the wicks accordingly. Now, oftentimes you want to pack the wick closest to the tank tighter than the wick furthest from the tank because for some reason the wicks furthest from the tank sometimes will, will be starved for alcohol just because of the feed system. So if you pack them looser, they can draw more and burn more evenly. To make sure your wicks are packed properly, set the burner in a vise like this and go ahead and ignite it outside the engine and check the fire. If it's leaping and dancing all around and is just crazy, you've got too much um, alcohol coming through, which means your wicks are packed too loosely. If they're puny little flames and the wicks are getting red around the edges, that means they're packed too tightly and you have to take a few strands out. Like I say, it's trial and error. Give it a few shots, you'll get it. The last thing I want to demonstrate, which will just take a second, is filling an alcohol burner with alcohol. You take your meths, 
and you get a syringe like this. It's a nice big fat one. You can probably find these at a veterinary supply store. Get a piece of rubber tubing to stick on the end. That'll give you some depth so you can get down to the bottom of the bottle. Stick it in the bottle, draw some up, any amount, and get the tube, get this rubber tube so that it will fit over the filler tube on the burner and make a nice seal. Now you just slowly pump it into the tank until you see it start coming out the overflow just like that. I'm going to keep it going just so you can see it for a second. Then you stop it, pull it back a little, which will take out the alcohol in this tube, and take it off. You're ready to go. You should always fill the alcohol tank in the engine in a different place from which you fire it up. You fill the tank, as soon as it's full, you move your engine over to your steam up place for ignition. The other favorite fuel besides alcohol is gas. And when I say gas, I mean butane gas and not propane. The difference is not in their burning characteristics, which are similar, but in their storage pressures. Propane stores at a much higher pressure than butane. And as the gases are heated, both of their storage pressures go up significantly. So if you have the gas storage tank actually on the locomotive near the boiler, as opposed to, say, in the tender, which would be away from the fire, the gas tank will heat up as well. So if your gas tank is at a pressure of, say, 100 degrees Fahrenheit, which really is not unreasonable, your storage pressure for propane is probably around 200 or 250 pounds per square inch, whereas butane is probably around 70 to 80 pounds per square inch. As you can see, butane is much easier to manage than propane. Now, the locomotives that you buy commercially are designed for use with butane gas. The storage vessels, that is the pressure vessels that store the gas in these locomotives are designed for butane and not for the pressures exerted by propane. So, propane is out, butane is in. Now, like alcohol, butane gas has both advantages and disadvantages as follows. In the advantages column, we have the fact that it burns hotter than alcohol, which allows you to get steam up quicker. It's also neat to use, and you don't risk spilling it. It's the fuel of choice for single flue boilers, as we saw earlier, and it requires no firebox, which uh, can be a definite design consideration. Disadvantages include the fact that if you let your boiler run dry, a butane fire will burn it up, which is generally considered to be bad form. Also, the burner mechanisms themselves are more complex to make and to use, and they can get out of adjustment more easily than an alcohol burner can. Butane is also more expensive than alcohol. A little container, which is enough to fire a medium-sized engine, say, maybe three times or so, costs over a dollar and a quarter. It can be purchased in larger canisters at uh, tobacco supply houses or even larger con containers at uh, sporting goods stores for use with camp stoves and things. The problem with the larger containers is a transference problem. The locomotives that are commercially available have filler valves that are designed for use with the grocery store type cigarette lighter refills. The camp stove canisters have completely different transfer systems and you would have to devise some way of getting the gas from the can into the locomotive. The final disadvantage of butane is the fact that the gas is heavier than air and if you're working in a, in a shallow depression in the ground and you have an undetected gas leak in the locomotive, the gas can settle around your feet and create a hazard. I'm telling you this from an experience that I had. I was doing exactly that. I was filling the locomotive one day in a shallow depression. I had a gas leak that was undetected, and the gas came out of the engine and settled around my feet. Gas is invisible. I didn't know it. So I turned all the valves off, set the gas canister aside, struck my match to ignite the engine, and instead I ignited my shins. I was wearing shorts at that time, and I burned all the hair off my shins. No damage was done really, but it could have been a lot worse. And anyway, I never consider a steaming day complete unless I can return home with the smell of burning hair around me. I'd like to demonstrate how you fill and ignite a gas-fired engine. This engine here is Anna, made by the Beck Company of West Germany in about uh, 1979 or 1980. It was commercially available for a while until they went bust. The gas tank in this engine is located inside this dummy side tank. The gas filler valve is right here, rather difficult to see, it's very unobtrusive. 
The gas control valve is here, not at all difficult to see and very obtrusive. There's a gas line that comes out of the tank, goes back through the cab, around, and into the burner. The burner is located inside the boiler, this being a single flue gas-fired boiler. So what we have here is your handy Ronson multi-fill butane fuel, very expensive, but that's what this engine is designed for. The way you fill the engine is you make sure that the gas control valve is closed, up in the fuel, and just get a good pressure fit into the control valve and push it down. It'll make this noise while it's filling, and when it's finished filling, the liquid gas will come out the top. And that'll just take a minute here and we'll see it. There it is there. So we take this off, get it well out of the way. We take our match, light it. Now this particular engine ignites at the stack, so what we do is we open the control valve slightly until we can just hear a hiss inside the boiler. And we hold the match to the stack. That's what it is. The fire flashes back down through the smoke box into the boiler. And the fire is now entirely contained inside the boiler, presenting no particular hazard. One of the drawbacks to gas-fired locomotives is the fact that they do make noise. That's about the noise level that you should have for rapid steam raising. And some people consider it a distraction, and some people consider it uh, a fact of life. This is a real steam locomotive. This is what it should sound like. I'll turn it off here so we can get back on mic. We'll see a locomotive fired up completely later on so you can see the entire process. The last thing I want to demonstrate in regard to gas firing is flame adjustment on gas burners. The engine that you just saw, the Anna, was adjusted at the factory, so you have nothing to worry about there. However, some uh, engines, like the Astra Climax, for instance, you can adjust yourself. Now, what you're adjusting is the gas and air mixture. And I have a gas burner here. This little one was designed for the Mammoth engine. And this is lit. You probably can't see the flame for the same reason you couldn't see the alcohol flame before, but you will see it in a second. What I'm doing here is adjusting the air ring with this pair of pliers. And if you give the gas too much air, the fire goes out. And if you restrict the air by covering these air intake holes, the fire gets yellow. You see that? See how yellow that fire is? That's a no-no. You don't want that. What you want is to allow enough air in so that the flame is just right down on the burner and burning nice and blue. Just like that. Now I'll turn it off. And that's it. Now you know everything there is to know about gas firing. The last kind of fuel I want to talk about today is solid fuel. Solid fuel comes in two forms. The first is coal, and the second is some undeterminate pellet. And it's the pellets I'll talk about first. They look like this, and they're marketed by a company called Esbit, and also by a company called Mamod. Now Mamod, which is the maker of this locomotive, is the only company that offers a locomotive powered by this fuel. The way it works is you get a little fuel tray like this, you take a couple of these Mamod pellets, you drop them in the tray, you take the back off your Mammoth locomotive. You light the pellets, which I'm not going to do because they smell very bad. And you insert it under the boiler like that, replacing the back of the cab as you go. And what happens next? Not near enough. These pellets just are not equal to the task of propelling the locomotive. Most people who buy Mammoth locomotives without any experience and without anyone to turn to are very disappointed with the performance of the engine when running on these pellets. Most people either make or buy an alcohol burner for the Mammoth engine to replace these pellet burners. So my advice is forget the pellets and go with alcohol. Now coal, on the other hand, is another story. There have been very successful Gage 1 coal-fired locomotives built 
but they are a real hassle. Coal, to my way of thinking anyway, has more disadvantages than advantages. It's dirty. It very nearly always requires an internally fired boiler, and you just about have to stick with the engine throughout its entire run to make sure the fire is evenly laid, is burning evenly, and uh, that you have enough coal on it. So as far as coal is concerned, even though it smells great to some people, is really, I think, more trouble than it's worth. Now what kind of water do you use in your boiler? There's only one kind of water to use in the boiler. Distilled water. Don't use anything else. If you use tap water, it's full of minerals, it's full of deposits, it will eventually corrode your pipes on the inside, it will cut down the thermal efficiency of the boiler, and just make a big mess of your expensive locomotive. Distilled water is it. The end. Now we come to a really fun part in the program. This is mechanisms, valve gears, and all the other things that actually make the steam engine go. The first one we're going to talk about is oscillating cylinders. And I have in front of me an example of an oscillating cylinder. The cylinder is here. The steam line coming from the boiler is here. It passes through the throttle, which we talked about in the last section, and goes into the cylinder. When the thing's in operation, it goes round and round like that. And you can see that the cylinder is actually oscillating back and forth. The way this actually works is like this. Let me just take this apart here. So we can see what's behind there. Okay, now you see this block? This is called the port block. This is the block that the cylinder mounts to. And over here are two holes. The steam line comes in, and it goes out this hole, and below that is another hole. And the way this works is when the cylinder, let me show you the cylinder first. The cylinder has just a single hole back here. And what happens is, as the cylinder oscillates, it alternately aligns with one hole or the other. So what we have, let me put it back together here a little bit. The steam comes in, that top hole that you just saw, and it goes into the hole in the cylinder. And while it's in the cylinder, it pushes the piston out. Now, since it's tied on in the middle, the cylinder oscillates, and as the flywheel continues around, it moves the cylinder until the hole in the cylinder aligns with the second hole, which is the exhaust hole in the port block. The piston goes back in, and the steam goes out the exhaust hole. The flywheel continues on around, the cylinder oscillates back to its original position, and the whole process is repeated. Steam in, piston out, cylinder oscillates, piston in, steam out the exhaust. And that's basically how an oscillating cylinder works. This particular cylinder is a single acting cylinder. That means that the steam pushes it only in one direction and it relies on the motion of the flywheel to get it back to a starting point. Now a double acting cylinder would have a cylinder cap on the other end and the steam would push it in both directions. Steam in, steam out on the front end, steam out, steam in on the back end. Now, oscillating cylinders can be reversed very simply through means of a rotary valve, which exchanges the admission, which is steam in, and the exhaust, which is steam out. The valve looks like this in schematic. This is what it looks like from the top. There's, the valve is right here, and this is what actually rotates, and this is another port block similar to the one that the cylinder used. The way it works is the steam goes in here, the valve has a little cutout inside it that directs the steam down here, and then it goes into the cylinders from here. It comes back out the cylinders from here into another little cutout around here and is exhausted out into the atmosphere. Now when this valve is rotated over here, which it is in this example, the steam comes here, but instead of going down as you just saw, it comes up and goes into the cylinders through what was the exhaust line. It's exhausted through this one, through that cutout, and out. Why don't we take a look at a couple engines who use this system, and you can uh, see perhaps a little better how it actually works.
This is a model of a small vertical boiler British locomotive that runs on one single acting oscillating cylinder. Now coming out the top of the boiler here is a line that's connected to an air compressor. You can run your steam engines under compressed air to make sure the valve gears are working properly, the valves are set right, and all the mechanics are in good order. Now, this engine has that rotary valve that we just discussed, and it's controlled by this lever here. This is uh, reverse, and this is forward. There. Now, the reason the engine didn't start when I put the thing into gear, even though the boiler is pressurized, is because it is running on one single acting cylinder. The single acting cylinder has a power stroke in only one direction, relying on the flywheel to return it to its proper position. So you have a live stroke and a dead stroke, a live stroke and a dead stroke. These engines will not self-start generally. To have a self-starting engine, you should have, really you must have, two double acting cylinders. So let's get this one going so you can see how it goes. We'll put it into forward gear. I will rotate the flywheel around to its live position, and here we go. Now, because half of the stroke on this cylinder is dead, it doesn't have that much power. So to get the kind of uh, action in the wheels that we're getting, the engine has to be geared down. And on this particular engine, here's how it works. The cylinder is turning this flywheel, which is attached to a shaft. Also on the shaft is a much larger flywheel. And also on the shaft is a spring belt, which comes down here to a counter shaft. Connected to the other end of the counter shaft is this pinion gear, which works the crown gear on the axle, and finally translates the power from the cylinder to the axle, and the engine runs. Now I'll put it into reverse, so you can see it going backwards. And let's see if we can get it to self-start in reverse. Nope. So we'll just scoot it around here, and now we're going the other direction. Now the reversing valve on these oscillating engines can also be used as a throttle. I'll close this slightly, and you can see it slow down. Now you have to keep it running to the point so that the flywheel can return it to its position and uh, get it into the next cycle. If you close it down too much, it'll stop dead like that. Now let's look at another engine and see how that system works with another single acting oscillating cylinder. Now this is one of Astor's 1 to 32 scale models of a British locomotive. Astor is a Japanese company, but they make models of locomotives from around the world. Now you don't see any external cylinders on this engine at all. On the prototype, all the cylinders were contained within the frames and it, it, it was the usual setup of two double acting cylinders. However, on the model, we have one single acting oscillator that's uh, geared down to the axle on a four to one ratio. What that does is give you the same number of exhaust beats, which is four per revolution of the drivers. So let's hook up our air and we'll see this one go. I've, I've removed the safety valve and put a fitting in its place for the air hose. Now the throttle is controlled by this handle back here. It's self-started because the cylinder just happened to be in the proper position for the power stroke. Now, I'll turn this up like this so you can see what's happening while it's going. Now the cylinder is here, racing at a mad rate, and on the other side of the cylinder block, right over here, is the reversing valve controlled from the cab. The cylinder powers this flywheel here, which on the same shaft has a pinion gear, which runs this large spur gear. Now let me see if I can slow this down a little bit. So you can see it. Running gets much rougher. There, there, there. You can really see what's happening. You can hear the exhaust beat distinctly. And did you see the uh, rotary valve moving? Well, I slowed it down. I'll speed it up again. Now watch the valve closely. Can you see it? Oops, it stopped that way. Well, let's reverse it. We'll bring the valve all the way around to the reverse position and start it up again. have the 
throttle lever all the way forward. This is a strange engine because you push the lever forward to go backwards and you push it backwards to go forward. Now let me see if I can slow it down again. There we go. Now you can really see it working there. We'll turn it off. Put it back upright. And now for our last single acting oscillator, I'd like to show you an engine that uses a chain drive to make it go. This is a little tram engine. Tram engines were used on street railways back around the turn of the century and before, before electric trolley cars really came in. Now once again, this one runs off of a single, single acting oscillating cylinder. So let's take the top off and I'll show you how it works a little bit. Let me hold it up. The steam line, which is not this one, but the one underneath it, comes out of the boiler into the throttle, which is over here, through the lubricator, and into the cylinder. It has no reversing valve at all, and this engine actually goes only in one direction. Let's get the compressed air, hook it up, get going. Open the throttle a little bit. This is a very smooth running engine. Throttle it down, make it go slow, you can see it. This one, you can really get going quite slow. Open it up again, a little bit. Now, connected to the flywheel, which is being driven by the cylinder, is a sprocket with a chain on it. It goes through the floor, here to a counter shaft, which has another sprocket driving a chain to a larger sprocket. Now the axles are connected with yet another chain. This all sounds very inefficient, but actually it isn't. The chain is a Delrin plastic, and it runs very smoothly and really quite well. The gear ratio on this particular engine is 6 to 1, and uh, we'll see it running later in the garden. Now let's take a look at a couple of engines that use double acting oscillating cylinders. The first one is the Mammoth engine, made in England for the past several years, and I think by now the company's probably made about 30,000 of these things, literally, which have been distributed around the world. It's an inexpensive engine. It has a double acting oscillating cylinder on this side and on this side. Now remember, the double acting means the steam pushes the piston out and then it pushes it back. Let's hook up the air and we'll see it go. Now the reversing valve for this engine is located in front of the smoke box between the two cylinders. This long handle is actually just an extension handle to give you better sensitivity. That's an add-on that you can do on your own engine. Now since we do have two double acting cylinders, the engine will be self-starting. Watch. Just open the throttle and away we go. Open a little, little, little more, go faster. A little more, go even faster. And slow it down. Go the other direction. A little faster. A little slower. This extension handle makes it very easy to do this while the engine's on the fly. Stop it. Get rid of the air. And now we'll see an engine that uses double acting cylinders that's quite unusual. This is a model of a Shea engine built by Larry Lindsay. And it uses Mammoth cylinders, which uh, as you just saw are double acting cylinders. And since it has two of them, it is a self-starter. So without further ado, let's hook up the air and go for it. It's air. Now this is the throttle lever here. And it's connected to the rotary valve here, which in this engine is on top of the oscillators. So we'll just rotate it forward a little bit, and away we go. Now Shea locomotives were designed for logging operations oftentimes, and other situations that had rough track and steep grades and heavy loads. It's a geared engine, 
The cylinders are driving this uh, crankshaft here, which drives a uh, drive shaft on either side of it to the, the actual power truck. Now the advantage to these engines is that they can go around curves like this. Both of the, the trucks can swivel. And the steam mechanism is really up out of the way. Uh, you won't, won't catch any passing tree stumps or things like that with it. The slow running engines generally, they're geared down pretty much. This one burns alcohol. It's got a pot boiler on it. It's also got a pressure gauge. And a lubricator. That's pretty much it. We'll see this engine running also outside later on in the tape and uh, you can see what it does when it's actually under steam. Now a more sophisticated type of cylinder than the oscillating cylinder and also a more prototypical type is the fixed cylinder. As the name suggests, the cylinder doesn't move up and down like the oscillator does. The piston moves back and forth inside the cylinder and is controlled by a valve on top of the cylinder. The valve it comes in two varieties, the piston valve or bobbin valve and also the D-valve. Let's start with the piston valve. Now this locomotive has a piston valve and the valve is located right inside this box here which is called the steam chest. This is the actual cylinder with the piston inside it. Now a piston valve is called a piston valve because it's round and moves inside a channel like a piston does. Now I'm just going to unscrew this here and I'll take the valve out and examine it. This is what a piston valve looks like. It's just uh, essentially a long rod with some grooves cut in it and there's a hole that goes through it. Let me roll it over here. And the hole that goes through it communicates with this hole drilled into the side of it. And the valve, through moving back and forth, controls the piston. Now let's see how it actually works. Now this is the cylinder with the piston valve controlling it. The way it works is like this. The admission, generally through the top of the cylinder, goes in here and, and passes through one of the cutaways in the piston valve over here to the steam port. Comes in here, pushes the piston in this direction. While this is happening, the steam that's already been used on the other side of the piston is going out through the steam port in which it came into this hole in the side of the valve that we just saw through the center of the valve and out exhausted into the atmosphere. Now, the valve then changes position. It scoots itself back like this. The admission goes through that same cutaway into the opposite steam port, through there, pushing the piston back the other way. The old steam on the other side goes back out its port and directly out into the atmosphere. Now why don't we have a look at a couple engines that use piston valves and see how they go. Now this is a model of Ogwen, a Walsh slate quarry engine which uses piston valves. We're going to hook it up to the air. First I need to take the dome off, take the safety valve out, put the fitting in, and put the air to it. Now we'll put it into gear, get it going. Now you can see here the piston valve going in and out as it controls the piston. What's happening inside there was just what I described to you before. Now one of the advantages of piston valves is that they can be reversed with the same kind of rotary valve that uh, we use on oscillating cylinders. I'll turn the engine upside down and we can see the valve underneath it. Now the rotary valve is right here and it goes back to a linkage in the cab. Now watch it move as I reverse it. So I'll reverse the engine, I'll make it go forward again and we'll reverse it again. Now one of the disadvantages of piston valves 
is that they tend to wear out rather rapidly. And once they're worn out, they're worn out, and the only thing you can do is replace them. This is the Beck Anna locomotive made in Germany. It has piston valves, and uh, I'll just turn it on here and let you watch it run for a second. This is the throttle up on the steam dome. It has an internally fired gas boiler, single flue boiler. You can see that piston valve just working back and forth there, driving the piston. I'll slow it down so you can see it a little better. See the action a little more clearly. It's nice and slow. It's always a sign of a good working locomotive if you can slow it way down to a crawl. It's about as slow as you can get without it just stopping on you. Just watch that for a second. It's a nice elegant mechanical motion there going back and forth. And that's good, I think. Now, in addition to the piston valve, there's the D-valve, which essentially performs the same function as a piston valve, but does it in a little different way. And probably the best way for me to explain this to you is to actually show you a D-valve in its natural environment. This is the Astor Baldwin locomotive, and the D-valve resides inside the steam chest, as did the piston valve in its steam chest, and it controls the piston, which is down here. I'm going to take this apart so you can see what it looks like and what it does. This comes off, and this cover comes off, and then these all come out. This is the steam chest cover, and this locomotive is put together in very much the same way that a full-size locomotive would be put together. Now this decorative cover pops off, just like that, and this comes off. There's a Teflon gasket inside, which looks like it has come apart a little bit, and here is the valve. Now I'm going to tip this up into the camera so you can see it a little better. Like that. Now we're looking right down into the steam chest where the valve lives, and what happens here is steam fills this chest and goes into a port, which I think you can just see at the top edge of the valve down on the face against which the valve slides. The steam goes into that port and down into the cylinder, pushing the piston in one direction. Then as the wheels rotate, let's rotate the wheels, the valve changes position and exposes the other port while covering the first port that we saw. Now there's also an exhaust port under there which is always covered by the valve. Now the old steam that we just let into the cylinder comes back out of the cylinder through the port that's now covered into the exhaust port and goes out into the atmosphere. Meanwhile steam is filling the chest again going through the newly exposed port into the cylinder and pushing the piston in the other direction. Now like anything, D-valves have both advantages and disadvantages. One of the advantages is that um, they're much easier to adjust than piston valves are. And another is that they don't really wear out, they wear in. The longer the valve is in use, the more the sliding faces become mated to one another, making the valve more steam tight and efficient. In the disadvantage column, D-valves are much more expensive to make than piston valves, which drives up the cost of commercially produced locomotives. Another significant disadvantage is that they cannot be reversed by the rotary valve that uh, is used to reverse piston valve engines and also oscillating engines. You have to use some kind of valve gear. So why don't we have a look at the different kinds of valve gear commonly used on small-scale steam locomotives. <laughs> One of the most commonly used valve gears on small-scale steam locomotives is called the slip eccentric. The way it works is like this. You have an axle, which is that big black spot in the middle, and on the axle you have this funny shape here, which revolves with the axle. As this shape comes around, it hits this drive pin, which is a small black dot. 
Now that drive pin is attached to the eccentric, which is this large circle here, and it drives it around with the axle. And as the eccentric goes around, it creates reciprocating motion back and forth like this, which is transmitted through this valve spindle to the valve itself. Now, for the valve to be reversed, for the engine to be reversed, the valve has to be reset 180 degrees from its current position. So what happens is you manually push the engine in the opposite direction, rotating the axle and this pin driver here. The eccentric, which is not really fastened to the axle but is loose, slips on the axle as it's being rotated and that pin remains stationary until this pin driver comes all the way around and hits it as you see it here. Once this happens, the valves have been reset and you can turn the engine on again and the driver will push the pin around and the engine will continue in that direction. It might be explained a little bit better if I can show you an actual example of a slip eccentric at work. Now we're back here with good old Anna and Anna is running forward at the moment. Now Anna is a very unique engine in that its eccentrics are on the outside. Generally the eccentrics are inside mounted on the axles. Inside meaning inside the frames where you can't really see them. But this engine has them on the outside where we can see them going round and round right there. You can see how the eccentric is bobbing around as an eccentric should do, giving reciprocal motion to the valve which is up here. Now what I'm going to do stop the engine and I'm going to instead of manually pushing the engine backwards I'm going to actually revolve the eccentric around. See? Where it was first I'm moving it around 180 degrees. I've got to do this on the other side too because if I don't one cylinder will want to go frontwards and the other one will want to go backwards. Now they've been reset and all I have to do is turn it on and it will go backwards. There we go. Now if the engine was on the track, the way this would be accomplished would be you would turn the, uh, turn the throttle off and actually push the engine until the wheels had reset the eccentrics. And that's all there is to it. Now this is Sammy. This engine was made by Archangel of Great Britain and it has a couple of unique features in addition to the fact that it uses slip eccentric reversing. These outside cylinders that you see here are dummies. They're just there for show. In, in reality, the engine has only one cylinder which is located between the frames. The cylinder is up here and it drives a crank axle which is the rear axle here. Right next to the um, cylinder crank is the eccentric which drives the valve and through a set of linkages it goes to the valve which is on top of the cylinder and you really can't see it. Now let's see if we can reverse this engine. We turn it off, rotate the wheels in the opposite direction, 180 degrees. Now since this is a one cylinder engine, it will not self start generally. Turn it on. And you have to give it a push, either this way or when it's on the track. And now it's running in reverse. The eccentrics had uh, shifted when I spun the wheels and reset the valve so that the thing will operate in reverse. Now there are several other valve gears that are used on small scale steam locomotives and by and large they are actual miniature reproductions of the valve gears that are used on the full size locomotives. The first one we're going to look at is Walshart's valve gear. This is a cutaway model of Astor's Pennsylvania Railroad K4. This engine uses Walshart's valve gear. Now Walshart's is a very complex and sophisticated valve gear and it's really not the purpose of this program to teach you its exact function. What I would like is for you to be able to recognize these different valve gears on site. When I start this up again you can watch its motion and you can also see the motion of the pistons and the valves. Remember again, Walshart's valve gear. This wonderful piece of machinery is a locomotive built by the English designer Jack Weldon. 
and it too has Walsh's valve gear, although he has divided it and brought part of it back to the back. You may never ever see this on another model and will certainly not see it on a prototype locomotive, but I just wanted you to see it here because it is so incredible. This is Stevenson valve gear and almost always it's between the frames of the locomotive so you never really see it. There are a few instances on the full-sized engines where it's outside and it's fascinating to watch but I've never seen a model with this particular valve gear on the outside. This is a dual eccentric valve gear as you can see and uh, the engine that we have here today to demonstrate that is the Astra Climax. On this engine, like other engines with Stevenson valve gear, the valve gear is between the frames. I'm going to turn it on here and then I'll tip the engine back and you should be able to see the valve gear working as the engine is moving. Now I'll tip it back. And if you look here, you can see the valve gear working. Back here are the two eccentrics going around with the two valve rods to the expansion link here, driving the valve through a crank system that comes outside of the frames to where the valve is located. Let me see if I can reverse it so you can see what happens when it goes backwards. There we go. I'm going to stop it for a second. Now watch the reversing link as I reverse it. See how it goes up and down? Get back. Now it's back in reverse gear. I'll turn it on again and we'll watch it run for another second. Now the last uh, valve gear we're going to talk about is Hackworth. This particular locomotive is one of the Pooter class, designed by Jack Weldon and built by the British company Roundhouse Engineering. Now, Hackworth valve gear on the prototype was used, was used primarily on industrial and uh, small quarry engines, and it hasn't really shown up too much in, in the models, except uh, by the commercial models made by Roundhouse. I'm going to tip the engine back so you can see how it works a little bit better. It's a fairly simple valve gear. It has uh, relationships to other valve gears, and it is uh, easily reversible from the cab. We'll just watch it run here for a second so you can get a feel of how the thing looks. That pretty well covers most of the commonly used valve gears in small-scale steam locomotives. Now let's have a look at lubrication. <laughs> Now one of the most important points in maintaining these little guys is lubrication. It's really not hard at all, but it's something that you need to keep on top of. Basically, all moving parts on a locomotive have to be lubricated. You can see that uh, this, this engine has quite a few moving parts. Now for all the external parts, all you really need is a little drop of any household oil or lightweight machine oil. You should do this once every three or four runs and you'll be fine. Now, to lubricate the internal parts, primarily the valves and cylinders, you need a special oil. And this is steam cylinder oil, and you should be able to get it from any reputable live steam locomotive dealer. Now, many engines are fitted with a lubricator that looks like this. This is what's called a displacement lubricator, and it's either on the steam line or on a T just off the steam line. And the way it works is you open it up, you fill it full of steam oil, and you close it up and start the engine going. What happens is that as the steam passes through the lubricator, a little bit of it will condense into water and remain in the lubricator. Since water is heavier than oil, the water will sink, displacing the oil and forcing it out the top into the steam line. It will travel down the steam line and lubricate the cylinders and the, the valves from within. 
at the end of each run or at the beginning of the following run, you need to drain the water out of the lubricator and refill it with oil. That's all there is to it. It's very, very simple and very, very effective. And that has to be done at the beginning of every run. And that's basically all there is to lubricating an engine. <laughs> I've always felt that the ceremony of lighting up should be observed by proper dress. Your necktie really should be the tie-on kind and not the clip-on kind. I have seen people wear the clip-on kind, but they mostly run electric trains. Now before we get into actually steaming up a locomotive, I'd like to show you my toolbox and some of the tools in it. Now you can have a toolbox that looks like this, really ratty, grody, but full of character, tools thrown in at random, or you can have one that looks like this. This one belongs to Grover Devine. I've got all my tools spread out in front of me so you can see them, and we'll just take them at random. Uh, some of their functions are pretty much obvious, but some of them are a little more obscure. Have screwdrivers, various sizes and shapes, obvious. Now this is a very useful device. This is a little locomotive light-up stick, and the way this works is there's a Q-tip in the end of it here, and these are interchangeable. You soak this in spirits, in alcohol, light it, and you can poke it right up underneath the locomotive very easily to get it lit. A little crescent wrench is often useful for tightening and or loosening safety valves. Pliers, you can always use pliers. Diagonal cutters, generally useful. Small pair of scissors. These are nice for trimming your wicks and or replacing them if need be uh, out in the field. A pair of tweezers. These are good for adjusting wicks after they're in, in uh, the wick tubes, and you can also use these for tweaking the safety valve to see if you've got any pressure underneath it. A dental mirror. This one is lovely for poking under the engine to see if the fire is lit on all wicks. This is a nice little thing to have. Hemostats. These are surgical devices that they use for clamping off blood vessels and other gruesome things. These are good for um, what have you, tweaking safety valves, just generally gripping things. They don't let go. A small set of uh, socket wrenches are nice to have, particularly if you have Aster engines, which use a lot of socket or uh, hex head screws. Now this is the Aster uh, pump handle for the water pumps in the tenders of some of their engines. I keep mine in here. Also the Aster open end wrenches, these are good to have too. Extra wick material, I have both asbestos and fiberglass. Different oils, general lubricating oil, steam cylinder oil. I seem to have come away with just a single Allen wrench, but a whole set would be nice. Big syringe, I use this for filling with water and meths. And a little syringe, I use this for steam oil. Helps settle the tools. Now let's steam up an engine. Now this is Sammy. Sammy is an Archangel engine from Great Britain. Relatively simple beast. And the steam up procedure is um, generally the same sort of thing that you'd use for most engines. Now this engine has a removable steam dome over the safety valve, which I'll take off so it doesn't fall on my lap when I turn the engine over. The first thing we're going to do is lubricate. Upside down. This is undignified but necessary. Sort of like a trip to the doctor. A little lightweight machine oil on all of the moving parts. Now you don't have to use much, just a very little drop on all the bearing surfaces. We'll lubricate the engine just fine. You can do this once every three or four runs. And that should be quite adequate. Now that we're lubricated, we go right side up again. We'll turn old Sam around. Now back in the cab here, this white thing is the top of the lubricator. This lubricator is the cylinder lubricator that we've discussed before. Let me find my screwdriver. The thing we'll do, we'll take the top off. And we'll take 
the screw out, and a little water should drain out if there was any left in from the last run. Let's see. Okay, there appears to be no water, so we can put the screw back and we can fill the lubricator with steam cylinder oil. Tighten this up here. Now this is steam cylinder oil. Don't ever use motor oil because that can eventually really clog up the works. And the steam cylinder oil goes right in here. You need to fill it all the way up to the top. There we go. So that when the water goes in and the oil is displaced, it immediately, immediately starts going into the steam line to do its job. Now you want to get the top of the lubricator on pretty tight so you don't have any steam leaks. There we go. Now the next thing we'll do is put some water in the boiler. Now Sammy takes water through the safety valve hole. So I'm going to tie it, so we'll use a crescent wrench, loosen it up. Now there's no water glass on this locomotive. Grab my water. So how do we know when it's full? First of all, use a nice big syringe like this. These are perfect. So they go right into the top of the water jar. Get a piece of rubber, stick on the end of your syringe, very handy. Goes right down in the boiler. You can fill it very quickly. You can use a funnel if you have one. Do it again. Now what I'm going to do here is fill the boiler all the way up to the top. Now if you try to do that and then try to fire it up, all you get in your cylinder is hot water. But since Sammy has no water glass, I have no real way of knowing how much water is actually in the boiler. It was a good sized boiler. It's a pot boiler. It takes a lot of water. There are no tubes inside to take up space. The whole space inside the boiler is for water. Now it'll come bubbling out the top when it's full. Which ought to be any second now. It must have been bone dry. Mm. There it goes. Okay, we'll put the rest of the water back in the jug. Now, what we want is to have a boiler that's about two-thirds full of water. So, if the boiler is this tall on your rubber tube coming out of the end of the syringe, just mark off one-third down at the bottom, stick that back in the boiler, and suck that much water out. And that way, you'll know that you've got the proper amount of water in there. So we're taking quite a bit of water out. The exact number of cubic centimeters of water is really not that important, as long as it's a good approximation. Now we're getting a lot of air in the syringe, which means that our water is down to the level at which it is supposed to be. Okay, safety valve goes back on. Now. Tighten it up slightly. Safety valve doesn't have to be on really tight. It'll tend to tighten up anyway when it gets warm. Now the next thing we're going to do is fill it full of alcohol. Now we'll turn Sammy around so you can see what's happening. Now on this engine, the alcohol filler is here and the overflow is right over here next to it. Now I tend to use the same syringe for filling alcohol as I do for water, but I need to make sure the water's entirely out. So I'll just run a little air through it quickly. So that should clear it out of water pretty well. I think we can put the steam dome back on now. It's a nice little cosmetic accoutrement. And here's our meths, our alcohol. I think if I set it here, everybody can see all right. Erg, get off. Cap only a child can open. Fill this up. 
Now, you always want to steam up in a different place from where you're lighting up. That is, you always want to fill your alcohol in a different place from where you're lighting up. Now, this rubber tube will not go entirely over the filler tube, but I can make a good enough seal to make it go. So in goes the alcohol, and you just keep watching until the alcohol starts coming out. Oop, there it goes. Did we see that? It just comes, oop, okay, it came out the uh, overflow. Now since I want to light it up on the stand here to show you, I'm just going to mop this up. And everything looks copacetic. Okay, Sammy is now ready to be fired. Just want to move this little chain out of the way. So we're resting firmly on the buffers. Okay, take my little locomotive lighter. Get some alcohol on it. If you have your alcohol in a gallon can, the wide mouth is quite useful. Put the top back on the alcohol. Make sure it's safely littered and out of the way. I'm going to light this thing. Remember, you're not going to be able to see the flame. It looks like it did half a second ago, but take my word for it, it is lit. Underneath the engine, up into the wicks. Very good. That should do it. Make sure that's out. Set that out of the way. Now, to double check that our flame is lit, I'll just take my little dental mirror, stick it up under there. Oh, yes, that well, looks very good. So now, while Sammy's still cool, we'll just pick it up and we'll take it down to the track and away we'll go. Now once again, this is the Mammoth engine, only this time this one has been radio controlled. There's a servo mounted here inside the cab, upside down. Through the control arm is a reach rod, which goes all the way along here, up here to a bell crank. Now, the bell crank is uh, something you can make or something that you can buy at your local airplane store. The other end of the bell crank is connected to the throttle lever via a little ball joint here. Now, there wasn't enough room in the cab for all the other radio gear, so I normally carry it in a car behind the engine, which I think you can see here. This is the battery box. This is the receiver. And this is the on and off switch. Now, the Mammoth engine, because of the way it's set up, uses only one channel. So that gives you an extra servo that you can use to control an LGB type coupler, or you could rig it to blow the whistle in the Mammoth, or what have you. So, let's see how this runs. Turn the receiver on. Turn the, before I turn the transmitter on, I want to show you two things. The locomotive is set up on channel 2, which is over here. This is channel 1 over here. Channel 1 has no springs on the joystick. It will stay wherever I put it, so I'm not using it right now. Channel 2 has a center off spring. It goes up and down, and if you let go, it returns to the center. Since the throttle on the Mammoth is center off, that's a good thing. If you let go, it'll turn itself off automatically. I'll show you that in a second. So we'll turn the transmitter on. Now this is pr proportional. I'll move it a little bit, and it'll move the throttle a little bit, and the engine will start going a little bit. Move it a little more, it goes a little faster. A little more, a little faster. So you can really crank it out. Now when you're running under steam, you'll find that the Mammoth throttle is a little touchy, even with the radio, but with a little practice, you can control it very nicely. You can ease in and out of stations and do anything you want to. Now let's reverse it. Very slowly, take it over, backing down the track to the switch, crossing the switch, slow it down, and stop. 
change directions after the switch is changed and here we go again out onto the main line here we go a little faster pulling the train right along this is great stuff you can be 20 30 40 feet away oops i let go it snapped back to mid position the engine stopped no problem so that's basically how the mammod works we'll turn it off to conserve our batteries and we'll show you an engine that uses two channels for both reversing and throttle. This is old Edmund Halley again. This is the Poudre class engine from Roundhouse Engineering in England. And this is set up for two channel radio control. One channel controls the throttle and one channel controls the reversing gear. This is the throttle lever here. If I push it farther up, it goes faster. Pull it farther down, it goes slower until it stops. Now again, this lever has no spring action at all. It'll stay where I leave it. This other lever is the valve gear lever, and it has center off spring action. If I let go, the valve gear springs to neutral, and the engine will stop. See how that works? The first thing we do is put it into gear, then we open the throttle. Slowly, get a nice even start out of the station, and away we go. You can slow it down and stop it. Put it into reverse gear. Open it up again. And away we go into reverse. Now let's uh, put the transmitter down. And we'll have a look inside the cab to see how the uh, radio control in this engine is actually set up. The cab roof on this engine is hinged, so we'll open it up and have a look. First of all, you can see the battery pack is mounted to the roof of the cab. This is the on-off switch here, and the receiver is mounted down here to the back wall. The throttle is right here and the servo that runs the throttle is over here. This control arm between the servo and the throttle. Now I'll move the throttle arm and you'll see what happens. See that? That's closed, that's partially open, that's full open, that's full speed ahead. Closed, open. Very simple. Now the servo that controls the valve gear is way down here at the bottom underneath this tube, which is actually the burner filler tube. Now, I'll, I'll work the valve gear and let's see if we can see that servo going. Can we see that in there? That's controlling the valve gear linkage from forward to reverse with neutral off. Now, I think probably the next thing to do is to take these outside and fire them up and see what they really do under steam. Now that we've seen some simple locomotives running, both manually and radio controlled, let's go over to the Golden Gate Live Steamers Gauge 1 track where we can see some other engines at work, including some more sophisticated hardware. Here is Grover Devine's modified Merlin engine pulling a short string of boxcars. The Merlin Loco has an internally fired gas boiler and piston valves. This Climax engine is a model of the only three-truck, three-foot gauge Climax ever made. While we're watching the K4 run, let's take a close-up look at a cutaway K4 to review some of the things we've already discussed. Here's the tender, and on this model, almost the entire volume of the tender is given over to water storage. To get the water into the cold boiler, we use the hand pump. We slip the pump handle on, give it a few cranks until the water level comes up to where we want it. Next door to that hand pump is the gas tank. This is where the fuel of the engine is stored. There's the filler valve, and there is the gas control valve. Now from the tender, these fluids are connected to the locomotive through these different hoses, which are water and gas lines. 
The fittings in the cab of the K4 are pretty much like the fittings we've already discussed, so there's no real reason to review those. This is the boiler. The blue area is water, and the red area is where the fire is. This is the large flue, and that metal tube in there is actually the burner inside the large flue. The large flue communicates with the smoke box through a series of smaller flues. Now this metal tube is the superheater. It's actually the steam line which has come from the throttle but goes back through the superheater tube before it goes into the cylinders. It comes out of the superheater, goes through the floor of the smoke box into the steam chest. Inside the steam chest is the valve which controls the piston. When the piston is through with the steam, it goes back to the valve and out through the exhaust nozzle, up the stack, and out. Astor is Sir Nigel Gresley, built from a kit by John Hulls. This engine features three working cylinders, the third being between the frames and driving a crank axle. Walshard's valve gear controls the two outside valves, and a slip eccentric controls the valve on the middle cylinder. Here's Larry Lindsay's scratch-built Shea, powered by two double-acting oscillating cylinders. The Astor Schools Class 440 has a Smithy's boiler and burns alcohol. Astor's GER 060. This is the one we saw running on compressed air. It has only one single acting oscillating cylinder geared to the axle in a 4 to 1 gear ratio. Now before we close, let's talk a little bit about choosing your own first live steam locomotive. Perhaps the most important consideration for you to think about is what do you want your engine to do? Do you want to be able to set it and forget it? Sit back for half an hour and watch it go around? Or would you rather stick with it the whole time it's running, adjusting the throttle and the valve gear and making sure the fire is okay? It's up to you. You also have to examine your own mechanical background. Are you really able to cope with a complex engine? Another thing you might think about is building a kit locomotive. There are several fine ready-to-run locomotives, but if you build your engine from a kit, you'll be able to troubleshoot a lot better. Having built it, you'll know how it works, and if something goes wrong, you'll know much better where to look for the problem. Another thing is, make sure you're buying your locomotive from a reputable dealer someone who not only knows steam locomotives, but is willing to help you troubleshoot if something goes wrong. So there you have it. We've seen everything from this very simple Mammod locomotive to this very complex Astor K4. And when my childhood fears are realized and the government changes all of our electrical outlets, you'll still be able to play trains if you have a live steamer. Thank you.